Hey, welcome, guys. Uh, yeah, you got me surrounded by some real heavy hitters here, Joe, today. So hopefully um, I can bring you guys uh, with this talk here that uh, me and Joe talked about not too long ago. I had this idea because um, I, I, I was reading up on some things about this, and I really kept finding some pretty neat surprises that even I myself, either I didn't know or I, I'd forgotten, or I'm not even sure I ever even totally learned it. So I'm hoping that... Um, as uh, routine as this might sound, I'm hoping to surprise you guys a couple, three times maybe in this lecture a little bit. And at the end, you can tell me if I uh, accomplished that or not. So, okay, so I see our title slide is up. So basically, oh, I'm going to do an back. outline here, go, understanding the complexities of right-sided circulation. And I don't have any disclosures on that. So let's take a look at the outline. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to have a little introduction. But in this introduction, I'm going to pose three questions. And you're going to see what I mean by that. And hopefully, in this lecture, we're going to answer those. And these three questions are answers are, the, that are questions that all of us here automatically assume we know the answer to. Pretty sure we thought we've known them for a long time. And hopefully, I'm going to find out some things, like I said, maybe some surprises. First, so first, I'm going to hit the pulmonary circulation. What is it? The anatomy of it, the physiology of it, and some of the complexities that it uh, offers us or throws in our way, I should say, when we do extracorporeal uh, circulation. And then I'm going to do the same for bronchial circulation. The anatomy, the physiology, I'm going to talk about what it is and what are the complexities for that that, that, that are, are come our way for extracorporeal circulation. Then I'm going to talk about the right ventricle. You go into a couple of little interesting things, hopefully about that, and then we're going to bring it all together, answer those questions in the introduction, and try to see if um, we can have some nice conversation at the end. All right, Joe, so, um, so I said in the introduction, we're going to ask three questions in this lecture. And these are all questions that we all th thought we knew the answers to, but we're afraid to ask. That's what I call them. So here's number one we're going to be talking about. So knowing that all the blood entering the left atrium comes directly from the pulmonary alveolar capillaries, why does the oxygen saturation in the left atrium never reach 100%? I know why. Go ahead, Joe. <clears throat> and number two question, knowing that our blood circulation is one big circle, hence the name circulation, and the right and left ventricle are in series with each other, one is behind the other, feeds into the other. Why do medical textbooks say, quote, right ventricular output is approximately equal to 100% of the le left ventricular outflow? Go ahead. And number three question, Every organ in the body experiences infarcts. Anything can have an infarction. However, the lungs are extremely resistant to having infarctions. In fact, when is the last time you heard somebody say, this patient had a pulmonary infarct? And why do you think that is? All right, so let's dive in a little bit, Joe, okay? So here, I'm gonna expand upon question number one a little bit, so you're not just taking my word for it. Knowing that all the blood entering left atrium comes directly from the pulmonary alveolar capillaries, why does the oxygen saturation in the left atrium never re reach 100%? Well, here's uh, the famous uh, anatomy and physiology book by Tortora, 2014 edition. And he quotes, ever wonder why the org oxygen saturation is not 100% in the left atrium and left ventricle? And down at the bottom, the journal in 2009, National Jewish Health also says, healthy individuals at sea level usually exhibit oxygen saturation between 96 and 99%. Again, we cannot seem to hit that 100% mark. Go ahead, Joe. If you do a search and you go on Google or whatever and bring up diagrams of the left ventricle and the, and the blood saturations in the heart, you'll see there, and you can find a lot of these. It's just two I picked off. And you can see there on the right, it says the left atrial saturation is 97%. The one on the left says the left ventricular saturation is 96%. Now, I just want to make a side note. You can find readings and you can find diagrams like this that say the saturation is 95 to 100%. You might even find some that say 100%. But if you do, those people are being uh, loose and fancy free with the facts. So, mm -hmm. but you can find it. Do we? Ahead, do we? I mean, do we get to answer this question <clears throat> and win a prize, or do you? Are you? Uh, just no, gonna... but I, we're going to answer it all at the end together. Okay. Yeah. So. Now, a little bit about number two. So these aren't just things I'm making up. What about the right and left ventricle are in series with each other? Why do the physiology books say 
right ventricular outflow is approximately equal to 100% of the ventricular outflow. Well, this is Levitsky's Pulmonary Physiology 2018 medical textbook quotes this exact saying right here. And then number three, I think, is next there, Joe. So why do we not ever hear about, or very rarely, a pulmonary infarct? Or this patient had a lung infarct. We hear about mm. myocardial infarct, strokes, and a million other uh, areas that can have a stroke or, or due to a blockage or a schema. But why hardly ever in the lung? Well, lung infarction is what you would think. It's death of lung tissue due to a lack of adequate blood supply. The section of dead tissue would be called an infarct resulting from an obstruction like a clot or an air bubble in a blood vessel that served the lungs. And here, an Encyclopedia Britannica even says this, in healthy lungs, such blockages fail to cause death of a tissue, i.e. an infarct, because the lung tissue is perfused by alternative routes. We're gonna take a look at how that is. All right, so there's the three questions in the outline. We're gonna start off with the pulmonary circulation and work our way down. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, I just wanted to remind you guys. So, the pulmonary circulation. The pulmonary circulation transports poorly oxygenated blood from the right ventricle to the lungs. We know that. The main pulmonary artery, which originates from the right ventricle, gives rise to the pulmonary circulation. The main pulmonary artery bifurcates into left and right pulmonary artery in order to service each lung. Eventually, it becomes a dense network of pulmonary alveolar capillaries where the blood releases its carbon dioxide and gains oxygen, which binds to the hemoglobin inside the red cells, and pulmonary alveolar capillaries empty into pulmonary veins, which carry oxygenated blood back to the left atrium. All this is an anatomy review that we all know. And if you wanted to see what it might look like uh, in some type of uh, fancy diagram, the, the, you see the right arrow there leaving the heart, the pulmonary main artery, and it goes out to both the left and right lungs and a vast network of capillaries as blue blood comes back oxygenated, dumps into the left atrium there, that red arrow, all that oxygenated blood comes back into the left atrium. That's our pulmonary circulation. So let's look at pulmonary anatomy real quick. Well, it starts off with the upper structures of the nose and the pharynx. The pharynx is a nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx. These structures filter, humidify, and warm the outside air. They also help us equalizing our ear pressure. Then we go down to the uh, lower respiratory system, and these lower structures are the trachea, carina, where the trachea bifurcates, bronchi, bronchioles, or alveoli. The lungs encompass the entire thoracic cavity except for the mediastinum, which is the heart, major blood vessels, and the bronchi and the esophagus. So that gives us some idea what we're looking at on the anatomy side. And then, of course, we have uh, two lungs. A, the right lung is divided into three lobes and is actually uh, larger and performs 55% of the lung activity. And the left lung is actually a little bit smaller. And it's in two lobes, and it performs about 45% of the lung activity. And the reason for that, of course, is our heart is displaced to the left, and it takes up some of the room that the left lung cannot occupy. So let's look a little bit more now where the rubber hits the road, and that is the alveoli, right, which are tiny air sacs that sit at the very end of our respiratory tree, and they're arranged in clusters throughout the lungs. They are the functional unit of the respiratory system whose purpose is, is to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide to and from the bloodstream. And there's about 300 million alveolar in our lungs. And you can see there on the right, unoxygenated or desaturated blood comes in to the capillary that's up against the air sac, the alveoli. It releases its carbon dioxide and then it gains oxygen. And as it leaves, it leaves as red or oxygenated and saturated blood, right? So here's a pulmonary arteriogram, pretty fascinating one that I found and really gives you some idea if you've never seen one, how incredibly vast the network of blood vessels is to our pulmonary lungs, to our pulmonary anatomy. So let's talk about pulmonary physiology. Go ahead, Joe. So the major function of the lungs is gas exchange. Pulmonary circulation supplies deoxygenated blood to the lungs where red blood cells release carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen, and eventually that is sent to our tissues, right? Pulmonary blood flow ideally needs to match the ventilation for maximum gas exchange. In respiratory physiology, the ventilation to perfusion ratio, also known as the VQ ratio, is a ratio used to assess 
the efficiency and adequacy of the matching of these two variables, the ventilation and the perfusion. V for ventilation is the amount of air that reaches the alveoli, and Q, the perfusion, is the amount of blood that reaches the capillaries of those alveoli. So this VQ ratio is defined as the ratio of the amount of air reaching the alveoli per minute to the amount of blood reaching the alveoli per minute, and that gives us our ratio of these volumetric flow rates. So these two variables, V and Q, constitute the main determinants of the blood oxygen and carbon dioxide concentration in our blood. So thus leads us to a concept called ventilation perfusion equality or ventilation perfusion mismatching known as what I said, the VQ ratio. So now, ideally the oxygen provided via our ventilation would saturate the blood 100%. Knowing that one liter of blood holds about 200 milliliters of oxygen and one liter of humidified air has about 200 milliliters of oxygen, therefore, the ideal ventilation perfusion ratio would be 1.0 or 100% saturation. In actuality, the typical value is approximately 90 to 95% saturation. And all of you guys know that because when you put a pulse ox on someone's finger, it reads almost always between 90 and 95% in normal routine physiology, not being on oxygen. So let's look at this a little bit further now. So the principal factor affecting this VQ gradient between the upper and lower lobes of the lung is gravity. The apex of the lung is gonna have a higher VQ uh, ratio, meaning higher saturation, but the base of the lung is gonna have a lower VQ mismatch, decreased saturation. When, you stand, when you're standing upright or sitting up in an upright position, gravity causes a greater amount of blood to travel to the lower lobes of the lung, and less of that blood travels to the upper lobes. So at the base of the lungs, blood perfusion is therefore greater than the ventilation that it's receiving, lowering the VQ ratio. This results in a lower saturation. In the upper lobes, however, blood perfusion is less than the ventilation. You actually have more ventilation than, than the amount of blood coming through. So you have a very high saturation in the, in the upper lobes, and so their VQ ratio would be much higher there. So in the last sentence there, VQ ratios change according to position, orthostatic position versus prone position. When you're lying down, the same thing happens, unfortunately, but now a lot of the blood is to the posterior sides of your lungs and not to the anterior. So you almost always have this mismatch going on. Here's a paper in 2013 by Dr. Wang and his associates, risk factors for pulmonary complications following cardiac surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass. So now that we've talked about the anatomy and physiology, what are some of the complexities that this pulmonary circulation poses to us as perfusions? So they looked at they evaluated risk factors for post-op pulmonary complications. They took 2,056 adult patients that underwent cardiac surgery with uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, and they found there was a 7% or 143 other adult patients suffered from post-op pulmonary complications. And they revealed independent risk factors for post-op pulmonary complications, which, include, which included all those things I have listed there, old age, greater than 65, congestive heart failure, low PAO2, you know, we already have predisposed lung issues, cardiopulmonary bypass, greater than 80 minutes, aortic procedures posed a higher risk, people with AKI, being a woman, smokers, people with diabetes mellitus, hypertension, of course, people with COPD, and then if you suffered any intra-op phrenic nerve injury, that also predisposed you to higher pulmonary complications post bypass. So now let's talk about the bronchial circulation. And it is a separate circulation from the pulmonary circulation. It's completely separate. It's complementary to the pulmonary circulation, however. But the bronchial circulation supplies fully oxygenated arterial blood to the lung tissues themselves, the parenchyma of the lung, the lung tissue. It supplies nutrients and oxygen, also carries away the waste products. It also perfuses the bronchi and the pleura to meet their nutritional requirements. So we have two circulations. We have the pulmonary circulation, which is the functional unit of the lung, oxygenating our blood. But then the bronchial circulation is perfusing the tissues of the lung, right? So if we go ahead, go back, Joe. So in the, uh, in the bronchial circulation, this is the steps that the blood goes through. If you look at the aorta diagram there, the bronchial arteries branch from the descending aorta just 
below, just past the left subclavian takeoff, really at the very beginning and the upper beginning of the descending aorta, you're going to have these tiny branch arteries that are the bronchial arterial branches. Now, I put that diagram there. Um, you can have any combination of these. There's, there's a lot of variations when you, when you look at genetic differences of people. Sometimes people have two on one side and one on the other. Some people have two and two. Some, pe some people have an artery that bifurcates. But regardless, you have these arteries that come off at this point of the aorta, perfusing the lungs for the lung tissue of the bronchial circulation. So let's look at this now is where it gets a little interesting. The lung tissue perfusion occurs, exchanging oxygen, carbon dioxide, nutrients, and waste between the blood and lung tissues. And some of these bronchial, remember I said pulmonary alveolar capillaries, these are bronchial capillaries. Some of the bronchial capillary venules, right, as it leaves the capillary, merge into the pulmonary alveolar venules and subsequently empty into the pulmonary veins. So you see the drawing there. You have your pulmonary uh, alveolar capillary at the bottom, but your bronchial capillaries, the ones that are perfusing the tissue of the lungs, the venules empty themselves. Some of them merge into the venules of the pulmonary artery, depositing venous blood into the pulmonary vein, and it travels on, on, on its way back to the left atrium. Go ahead, Joe. That's number one. Number two, you actually have independent, independent bronchial veins that lead from some of these bronchial capillaries. Not all of them merge with the alveolar capillary. Some of them have their own individual bronchial vein, but the bronchial veins of these empty right into the pulmonary vein also, which keeps sending deoxygenated blood back to the left atrium mm -hmm. as well. Hey, John, can I say something? Sure. How many times did uh, you, John, or you, Mike, or Rodell, if he's in there, uh, how many times doing a, doing a mitral valve through the left atrium and they're we're getting flooded, we're just getting flooded and can't figure out where it's coming from. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep, and we're gonna touch on that a little bit. So there's one more There's one more uh, perfusion structure to this bronchial circulation I wanna show you there, Joe, go ahead. Next one. Yeah, so, and as it turns out, so if you think about it now, you have this lung being perfused and it's venous deoxygenated blood is going into our oxygenated blood of the pulmonary veins, mixing with that and going back to the left atrium. Whoever you subscribe to as our maker must have been scratching his or her head saying, this is counterproductive. Why are we mixing deoxygenated blood with our oxygenated blood going back to the left atrium? That defeats the purpose of why this blood is coming back to the left atrium. So believe it or not, there is about one quarter of the actual bronchial circulation has bronchial veins, but these bronchial veins lead over to our vena cava system as we would have expected it to do, and it actually dumps into the superior vena cava. So this is about 25%, and by the way, this can vary 5 or 10% with each individual person, but basically about 25% of the, of the venous bronchial blood does go back to where we would have expected, which is the superior vena cave. And it basically gets there by running into the azygos veins and hemiozygos veins and going up the azygos system and emptying right there into the SVC. So it, it makes its way back to the venous side as we would have expected it to. So let's look at bronchial physiology. The bronchial arteries branch from descending aorta and carry oxygenated blood to the lungs. This leads to pulmonary capillaries where there's exchange of oxygen carbon dioxide, nutrients, and basically perfusing the tissue. It's one quarter of this venous blood goes to the bronchial veins of the superior vena cava, and three quarters of it is being routed to the pulmonary veins and onto the left atrium. This three quarter bronchial circulation is effectively an arterial venous shunt. That's what's important to remember, right? It's going from the left side back into the left side. So what is the complexities for extracorporeal circulation, Joe, you basically touched on it there. And uh, this is a paper uh, back in the 1997 talking about, you know, some of the things that can happen with our bronchial uh, vasculature. And uh, it's interesting, the formation of new bronchial vessels, angiogenesis, occurs in a variety of chronic inflammatory infections and ischemic pulmonary diseases. So in contrast to the pulmonary circulation, the bronchial circulation has a remarkable, remarkable ability to proliferate. 
You're talking about some patients having more flow than others. Hypertrophy and angiogenesis of the bronchial circulation in response to a variety of stimuli, including chronic lung infections, pulmonary artery occlusion, lung tumors, and lung transplantation. So the bottom line, the bronchial blood flow has implications for extracorporeal circulation as this persistent blood flow must be constantly vented or in some way accounted for as it enters the left atrium and causes visualization difficulties for the surgeon. So we all know that part. So here's a little surprise, Joe, that I did not put into the outline. This is a little surprise, and you guys can tell me at the end if you were surprised by this or not. So we talk about two separate circulations for the lungs. However, they're complementary. There's a complementary relationship between the bronchial and pulmonary circulation. Lung infarction occurs when an artery of the lung becomes blocked and part of the lung dies. But because of the dual blood supply to the lungs from both the bronchial circulation and the pulmonary circulation, this tissue is extremely resistant to infarction. Now, an occlusion of the bronchial circulation rarely causes an infarction, but it can occur in a pulmonary embolism because the pulmonary circulation is blocked and the bronchial circulation cannot fully compensate for it. So you can have a lung infarction. It is possible, but it's highly re resistant to it. So this is the reason why. I haven't explained why that is, right? A unique characteristic feature of the pulmonary vasculature is the extensive system of something called supernumerary vessels. These vessels branch off at right angles from the arterioles from the accompanying arterial vessels and supply nearby respiratory tissue also. The functional significance of these vessels is to provide collateral flow to surrounding tissues if the bronchial vessels are ever occluded. So as it turns out, the pulmonary circulation also perfuses our lung tissue as well as the bronchial circulation. So here's some questions hopefully we can get some answers to. But we're just going to start with questions one or two. We'll get to the third one after the right ventricle talk. So knowing that all the blood enters the left atrium, comes directly from the pulmonary alveolar capillaries, why does the oxygen saturation in the left atrium never reach 100%? Go ahead. And the pulmonary circulation, there's actually two answers, right? The pulmonary circulation, due to that VQ mismatch, cannot produce... 100% saturation. You have less than 100% uh, saturation in the lower lobes especially. Blood perfusion in the lower lobes is greater than the ventilation, so the blood cannot be fully saturated, resulting in a lower saturation. In the lower lobes, the saturation is only approximately 90%. That's one reason. Three quarters of the bronchial circulation is effectively an arterial venous shunt. So desaturated bronchial blood is being routed to the pulmonary veins and back into the left atrium. So these two factors, incomplete saturation of the pulmonary blood and the bronchial circulation, depositing desaturated blood into the pulmonary veins, are the reasons why we cannot have 100% saturation in the left atrium. So, the question number two, knowing that our blood circulation is one big circle and the right and left ventricles are in series with each other, why do the medical textbooks say right ventricular outflow is approximately equal to the left ventricular outflow? Go ahead. So going back to the bronchial circulation, those bronchial veins that are leading into the pulmonary veins and the two I showed you, one where they merge into the alveolar venules and one where bronchial veins hook directly into the pulmonary vein, this sends the bronchial venous blood back into the pulmonary veins and back into the left atrium, right? This, go ahead, Joe, this is basically taking arterial blood from the aorta, sending it to the tissue of the lungs, and instead of it going to the venous circulation, it comes back into the left atrium. And by the way, I say on the right there, the bronchial flow is approximately 1% to 3% of the total cardiac output. So this basically, and I put down there at the bottom, um, these two factors, the bronchial circulation is effective, is effectively an arterial venous shunt, and because the blood leaving the left ventricle is sent right back to itself via the left, via the left atrium, the left ventricular outflow, the cardiac output of the left side, left side, must be one to three percent greater than that of the right ventricle. 
Go ahead. More? You got the clicker? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, one more? I thought I did it. Okay. Okay, so what? let's talk about the right ventricle. Can, can I raise my hand? Um, I don't know, because you might have to uh, hear this first. I don't know. What's your question? <laughs> so, so you, did, you didn't mention Thebesian veins. I didn't mention the Thebesian veins, no, but that is also true because that's uh, uh, affecting in the heart, right? Yes, yes, because that's also a right to left shunt. Mm -hmm effective right to left shunt, I think, mm -hmm. pretty sure. But I thought so, I'd add that uh, in just to show that I'm smart. <laughs> Go ahead. Here's, here's something that we hardly ever hear also. Everybody says ejection fraction, left, mm -hmm. left ventricular ejection fraction. In fact, you don't even have to say left ventricular. When somebody says, what's the person's EF, you automatically know they're talking about the left ventricle. Why does nobody ever talk about the right ventricular ejection fraction? In fact, what is the right ventricular ejection fraction? Do we just assume it's exactly the same as the left? Well, as it turns out, it is actually not. It's actually about 5% lower. So while, nef left, while normal left ventricular ejection fraction is about 55 to 60%, right ventricular ejection fraction is about 52 to 58%. So let's look at this a little closer. Echocardiography, by the way, is not a reliable way to look at right ventricular ejection fraction. A better way is through MRI. But when you do take an echocardiography, a four-chamber view like on the left there, and if you look at it, the right ventricle appears smaller than the left ventricle. If you look at normal anatomy like on the right, the right ventricle appears larger than the left ventricle. So it's very difficult to get a perfect side-by-side -side section of these two ventricles. And our impression, I think a lot of us have, is that the left ventricle is actually uh, larger than the right. Well, do we really know that? Go ahead. So here are some numbers for you. And this is right down the middle, you know, 75 or 80 kilogram man, healthy routine. And this can vary on either side of these numbers by 10, 15% at least. But this is for a healthy individual. You compare the right and left ventricle. The end diastolic volume of the right is about 145, but the end diastolic volume of the left is a little bit smaller, about 142. So as it turns out, the chamber size of the right ventricle is actually a little bit larger. The end systolic volume, after it ejects on the right ventricle is about 51, and the left ventricle is about 47. So your stroke volumes are pretty similar. Your stroke volume on the right ventricle is 94 milliliters, the left ventricle being 95. So the ejection fraction here would be a right ventricle ejection fraction of 65% with a left ventricular fr ejection fraction of 67%. So at a heart rate of 75 beats per minute, and this is where it gets interesting. If you did a swan GANS on that patient that's seeing here on the diagram, you, you shot a cardiac output with those numbers that I have there, your cardiac output would come back at 7.05 liters per minute, 7,050 cc's per minute. That would mean that the left ventricular output is 7.125 liters per minute, okay? Which means the right ventricular output is 120 cc's less per minute. And that is because of the bronchial circulation. So why is this important? Why do we care? Uh, this is one reason why, there may be others. In the cases of if you're ever managing an RVAD, LVAD, or a BIVAD, Due to the bronchial circulation, one must always account for the left ventricular output being 2 to 3% greater than the right ventricular output, right? If you have a BIVAD going, you have two separate uh, pumps, an RVAD and an LVAD. One thing we always say at our institution is one must never overflow the right side in cases of an RVAD or BIVAD because if you, the left should always be flowing a little bit more. It's very uh, scary to see if the right side is flowing the same or more because of what we just said. The left side should always be flowing slightly higher. And if you don't have that, you could cause flash pulmonary edema, which we have seen. All right, guys. So what did you think about all that? Thank you so much for listening. Very good. I Pretty thought good. it was great. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it a lot. Did um, you know all that? <laughs> um, did I know it? Um, you know, Maybe not the stuff on the on the RV output, uh, but it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I never really considered it. 
Uh, but I do know, I mean, I have heard that too when, when we're doing bivads. And I remember back in the old days where we would have two biomedicus pumps right. or we'd be using that old Travanol thing that they used to have. Mm -hmm. I remember that. Right. And that was with roller pumps. And you had to, you had to make sure that you adjusted that. The, the, the left side was just slightly higher mm -hmm. than the right side. Yeah. And you'd always be kind of, it was very difficult because you'd collapse the right side and then you'd have to slow the other one down a little bit, right. let it all catch up. It was, uh, they were very difficult to run. Uh, oh, somebody's calling in. Oh, and, and uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Campbell says, always run the LVAD slightly higher than the RVAD, RVAD, which is what you just said, also because of pulmonary edema. Mm -hmm. Right, that is a problem, because you'll back the whole system up. Right. Mm -hmm. You know? And who's, uh, hello, mm -hmm. you're on the air? Oh, they hung up? No, that's somebody, somebody's phone. Oh, it's not mine. <laughs> mine's on, <laughs> mine's on uh, mute. I don't know I can tell you a couple was... things that happens too, Joe, with the bivad. We had LVAD, the, the LVAD pump was uh, was getting going bad. It was rattling and it was uh, mm. getting very hot. And so we were going to have to change out the, just the LVAD while we still had the RVAD running. Mm. Don't ever just turn off that LVAD while you're changing it out and leave that RVAD running, right? Yeah, yeah, because absolutely. You can call flash pulmonary edema within 30 seconds. Yes. And it'll pouring out of the... Uh, Endo, endotracheal tube in yes. no time. Yes, and it looks bad. It it comes fast. I've seen I've seen fountains, mm -hmm. um, so it's really frightening to see. Rodell, you have any uh, any experience with that? I don't know if you do or not. Actually, I don't. Actually, I don't. But uh, no, I understand the physiology behind it. I didn't realize the percentages, mm -hmm. uh, but it makes total sense. Yeah, I mean that's for, this is a, John. This was a very interesting, mm -hmm. unusual talk because I think you're 100% right. We really don't, you know, again, it's like, I've said this before about the kidneys. Well, I, I say it, but you know, I think that the kidneys are an underappreciated organ. I don't think we really um, consider, for example, what the neurologic consequences are of what we do every day for our jobs because we don't see the patients later. And I think mm -hmm. we should be doing TCD on everyone. Um, I think, so we don't care for the kidneys enough, but unless you have a patient who has right ventricular failure and it's a nightmare, they're very hard patients to manage. Um, we no. underappreciate the right ventricle too, I think. We think about the left ventricle of the aorta and the arterial system, and we sometimes become a little, uh, we take the right ventricle for granted. I think we do. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. Well, John? a couple of things that I did not know when I was researching this that surprised me was I didn't realize that uh, not all of the bronchial circulation comes back into the left atrium. I didn't realize there was a venous route where about 25% or so ends up going over to our venous Well, actually, that's, with, I didn't know that either. Yeah, I, didn't I didn't know that. Know that. I thought all and, bronchial return dumped into the left atrium. I did, too. Mm -hmm. I did, too. And when somebody, um, I heard somebody say not too long ago, which sparked my interest, right ventricular ejection fraction. I thought to myself, before I just say it's the same as the left, do I really know that? And when I dug into it, it turns out your right ventricle, and then I said to myself, how do we even know the right ventricle is the same volume size? Because if it's a different volume size, mm -hmm. and you know, the thickness of the muscle is different, so maybe the chamber size is larger, maybe it's smaller. I, you know, if you look at it on, on a four chamber echo, it looks smaller but that you can't go by that because it depends the angle and yes. it turns out that it's um, a little bit larger so its ejection fraction can be a little smaller right percentage wise and then of course you have the bronchial circulation that the left side has to pump a little more so between the two they're not they're not exactly the same mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah that ma makes a lot of sense to me it makes me wonder though because I've got a an, and uh, Rodell um, Jeff Campbell says hello and thanks for teaching him so well uh, at OSU, or when he was at OSU, and I guess did his rotation up there. So I wanted to pass that on to you. But it makes me wonder, what do we, what happens? I'm a, when, and thank goodness that the the bronchi, the the lung has two methods for being perfused, because if you do a big 
uh, thoracoabdominal, mm -hmm. or you do a uh, you do one of those uh, T vars, mm -hmm. uh, and you put a uh, big big stent graft in from just distal to left subclavian, you know, down around you know to the descending thoracic. Um, you're knocking all of that off. Right. So those yeah. people effectively lose their bronchial Local circulation, circulation yeah. if that's what the takeoff is. Yeah. And I, I wonder if that, I'm assuming, and I'd have to ask somebody if there's anything they have to look for. But it's a small amount, so I guess it compensates somehow, but there is no pulmonary infarct because you have two methods. Right. But I would assume that patient with a PE, even smaller PEs, would be much more susceptible to pulmonary, small pulmonary infarcts. Right, right. What do you think, John? Does that did make you, sense? I did not know also, the third thing I did not know was that there was any contribution of tissue perfusion from the pulmonary circulation. I did not know that. I thought that they, the pulmonary circulation was solely doing oxygen and carbon dioxide you know, exchange and the bronchial circulation was doing tissue perfusion. I did not know the pulmonary circulation actually is a redundant tissue perfusion for the lungs as well. I, I did not know right. that. Did I think you? it's, I did, but I thought it was primary, that the bronchial circulation in comparison is, is you know, that the pulmonary circulation is everything, um, or the, you know, just the normal, you know, you know, pulmonary arterial system going to the venous system. That's, I, I believe that's primary, and then your bronchial circulation is the redundant portion of it. Actually, you're actually correct, and this is how you don't, either, either you, you can have a, a pulmonary infarct or you cannot. If you have a large enough um, PE, pulmonary embolus, mm -hmm. you can have a pulmonary infarct. However, if you have a very large bronchial uh, obstruction, you will not have a lung infarct. And that is because of what you just said. As it turns out, the pulmonary circulation is the primary tissue perfusion for the lungs and the bronchial is a secondary. So you can have uh, a pretty big uh, um, occlusion of your bronchial circulation and not lose any lung tissue. However, if you have a very large pulmonary embolism and the bronchial circulation is just cannot, um, um, oh, is overwhelmed because it cannot perfuse enough of the tissue, you will have a, a pulmonary infarct, but it's actually caused from a large pulmonary embolus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I see that and that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another, another uh, listener says that uh, we should discuss the consequences of this return during ECC, uh, uh, ECMO, extracorporeal circulation. I think we kind of did, you know, we did a little bit, but I mean, if you're doing a valve, if you're doing, if you're mm -hmm. doing heart surgery and you have the heart open and they are getting flooded, I mean, that's the only maneuver we really have is to turn the flow down right. and let the pressure run a little lower which may be not so beneficial for everything else, but it goes back to what I've discussed uh, in previous programs, which is uh, that, uh, yeah, and I saw that, Jeff, um, previous programs that were they, we have to keep the patient alive. There are things we do to reduce the metabolic need. We run at the very tightest limits of perfusion pressures because the operation has to get done. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff brought up the need for LV venting, of course, absolutely. Right. Sometimes PA vents can help with that, uh, uh, you know, for the volume return to the left atrium. Mitral valve docs sometimes complain of venting uh, during ECMO need for, uh, 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 and also need for ejection. So those mm -hmm. are all very good points, Jeff. I agree with all of that. So uh, Rodell taught you well, or you learned it later, one or the other. I'm not sure, um, but uh, but yeah, I, I saw you laugh there. But um, but yeah, I think that these are some these are things we need to be thinking about and considering because I I know some younger perfusionists and when I was younger in my career too um, that you know the surgeons complaining I can't see I can't right. see I'm getting flooded right. what's wrong with my return and I think you know that those patients had just a very Hyper developed secondary to their diseases, mm -hmm. uh, John, which you were saying with all the collaterals, just a hyper developed bronchial direct, you know, right. circulation and mm -hmm. direct intracavitary return of that, plus 
you know, maybe even more, a, a more robust Thebesian uh, uh, Venus system, which is also dumping directly into there. And it's tough. It's very hard to, to, to work with that. Right, and, and if you remember back when we went through school and everything like that a long, long time ago. It used to be more common. The, yeah, the anatomy uh, was not as big a part of your curriculum as the actual clinical portion of the stuff that you did downstairs. And a lot of times when we'd hear these situations, like I'm just, I'm drowning up here. What, mm -hmm. you know, turn up the, the floppy, uh, give me a PA vent. Now it all, all makes sense why you had to do those things. Mm -hmm. But as a student, we didn't know where that blood was coming from. We, you know, it was very hard to figure out why. Mm -hmm. We knew it was there, it was causing problems. Mm -hmm. we, had, we knew we had to get rid of it mm -hmm. so they could do the surgery. Mm -hmm. But actually knowing, uh, you know, much, much more about it now, it, it all mm -hmm. makes sense, mm -hmm. it all makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah, and I think too, that's a very good, you bring up a very good point. And I think too that that's sort of a, a difference. John, I know, you, I know kind of where you come from and I think that, uh, you know, and I, I really feel that I was very blessed getting into this business when I did because mm -hmm. we had to scrub, we had to first assist, mm -hmm. we had yes. to, yeah. you know, we, there were so many things we did and, uh, uh, you know, and we learned this stuff because mm -hmm. we were, you know, I was still in the, I mean, not the, I mean, you have to think about this. I started my training, now you, you very close behind, I mean, not very mm -hmm. far behind, yeah, very you far. know, plus you had nursing school ahead of you, ahead right. of me. I was a corpsman, but you know, still very, I think similar. But um, from, the first, from the first successful use of the heart-lung machine to my first day of training, was only 20, 24 years. Yeah. 24 years. Yeah. When you think about heart surgery is now, how, how old from, from the first successful? 53 mm -hmm. to now, that's, uh, that's uh, 50 and 17, 67 years. Right. 67 years, yeah. Right. So, I, you know, you start back that early and there, we were all still learning these things. I mean, even the people that were teaching me we're still, right. we were all still learning things. And I think it was a really good environment to be in. Now it's become, you know, very, very computerized, if you right. will. It's right. not quite as, um, quite as hands-on as it used to be. It's different. Yeah. I was going to ask Rodell, uh, it, it, since we graduated from the same school, uh, be back in 80, 82, it was interesting uh, that back then when we went through the school, we had a one-year clinical program uh, and we learned uh, didactic along with that uh, in conjunction with the clinical we would come in do the first case go to class come back and do the last remaining two or three cases for the day and that's where it was I, I mean I was there the year we did 5,000 open hearts wow. at uh, St. Wow. Luke's and we pumped a lot of cases we certainly did but it was interesting and I wanted to ask Ro uh, on my uh, diploma I had it's a diploma program back then. There's yep. no bachelor of science or anything, and it says. Well, I have a diploma. It says. Uh, I have the same thing. Oh yeah, from but, my school. But it, it says cardiovascular assistant. It doesn't even say perfusionist on my diploma, and that's because we learned how to harvest the leg veins. Uh, we would cannulate with the surgeons. We would do post-op. We would uh, you know extract t chest tubes and stuff like that. D did yours change uh, from? Quite a bit, actually. Um, the mo I mean, we did the same thing. We had the didactic along with the clinical at the same time because it is a year program. We didn't do the hands-on things like pulling chest tubes or taking vein or cannulating or anything like that. That was actually more more the didactic portion of it. I mean, mm -hmm. you could you can go up at the head of the the head of the table and actually watch it, but. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that was that was pretty much it. I mean, we're very little um, scrubbing in because of all the fellows and you know the the younger physicians coming in. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. it, it was interesting. I, not too many people can say they had a chance to cannulate a patient with Dr. Cooley, and I thought that was that was pretty much <laughs> right. the highlight of my career right there. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. I'll never forget that one. But uh, mm -hmm. that's what we and all of associates too. So it was it was really really interesting. That is, he's, he was a gem, wasn't he? He, he was, was a gem, he was a gem. Um, can I tell a Cooley story? I mean, I know it's not relevant, you know, to the, to the topic at hand, but I gotta tell the story, it's a Cooley <laughs> story. Okay, so in 1984, 
I was at a meeting in Philadelphia and Dr. Cooley uh, was the guest speaker. And uh, you could meet him, they had like a, a line that you could go and mm -hmm. shake his hand and say hello. And uh, of course, you know, it was all heart surgeons and there were a few of my perfusion friends that were there and, uh, and they were all crowding, the, like, like they didn't care about us. <laughs> And I wasn't going to be denied. Yeah. So I, 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 I nudged my way through the mass of people and got up to them mm -hmm. and sort of startled the people that were like there because I was, I was nudging. Um, and I was like, Dr. Cooley, I'm Joe Bosch. I wanted to shake your hand, you know? And he's like, you know, and he was very gracious. He mm -hmm. was very kind. I was a young kid, you know, I looked like, you know, and he was, he was, he was very, very nice. Now he, he didn't remember that years later, but back around 2000 and, uh, I don't know if it was 2012, maybe, uh, when he won the Crystal Heart Award with mm -hmm. us in, yeah. in, at the New Orleans conference and he couldn't travel to the conference. He couldn't go. He was in that in that uh, 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 that little the motorized you know chair right. at the time and didn't feel comfortable traveling, and so we went to his office to do the award ceremony and he had his own film crew there. 